Following on directly from the final slide there, what is the role of vestibular, ocular and exertion therapies in the active management of concussion? Dr. Amuch is our next guest and uh, she's the clinical director of vestibular therapy at UPMC Sports Medicine Concussion Program. Thanks. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm going to present the, the role of a physiotherapist in um, the management of um, concussion and hopefully talk a little bit more about this active approach and how we consider it. So um, this is, so as you know, we're from Pittsburgh and uh, the Steelers are near and dear to our hearts and on Sundays in Pittsburgh, this is what our streets look like. So I was here the first Sunday in um, September and I saw this on the left and I thought I was home. Um, now there were some, also some chaps in uh, blue and gold who looked a little different than this, but um, it was quite exciting. So the passion for sports I think is ubiquitous, as are these types of injuries that um, you saw in Dr. Collins's talk about um, our issues with concussions are very much the same as yours, and we're trying to come together to manage them. And I think that um, in summary about concussion management, um, this is kind of what we consider are the keys. Um, first, obviously, is recognizing concussion, and that comes from the players themselves, that comes from um, coaches and um, parents, um, and understanding what the signs and symptoms are so that you're um, really recognizing it. Um, the concept of removal from play, as we talked about, it has to be um, foremost, it ha the culture has to change. We know that it's a process that evolves, um, and I think that um, what we've seen here is that you have some high-profile athletes who are now becoming um, advocates for this approach, and that will help you um, as it has helped us. But um, the culture has to change in removing from play. Um, and of course, you have to protect athletes from additional head injury exposure while they are recovering and facilitating recovery. Um, comprehensive concussion evaluation through a multidisciplinary process, and then active management. And that's the key, and that's the thing where we're really evolving quite a bit in how do we um, facilitate the improvement um, and the recovery, not just rest until it goes away. So this is, a, um, this is from 2006, but I think that this is a nice um, pictorial of um, the kind of natural recovery from concussion. And what you see is that, um, in, and these are high school football players, so understood that this isn't all injury, but these are, these are youth football players in, in the US. And approximately at the three week time period, about 80% are recovered, which is actually quite good. So if you think about it in theory, if we do the first three things in that management of concussion, which is identify, remove from play, protect from further injury. In about three weeks' time, four out of five are going to, to get better, and perhaps even more than that. But what that also means is that one out of five are not going to recover in that period of time, and those are our post-concussion syndrome patients. And those are the ones that I think we have the biggest opportunity to perhaps move them into the earlier group, or at least we hope. So can we influence recovery and modify this post-concussion syndrome with therapies or active approaches? And that's the question. And you've heard some discussion earlier um, about you know, the, what we think out there is the perception, at least across a lot, of, um, a lot of folks that manage concussion, is that you just rest, you rest and rest. And um, we see people in our clinic every day who have been told this approach, um, to, to utilize this approach and now it's three months, four months, six months after their injury and they're still with symptoms. So we know that this doesn't work for everybody. Um, and probably what is really the truth of this is figuring out who is the right patient, what are the right treatments, and what is the right timing to implement to really create that, that full recovery. And uh, this is the work that has to be done. So who is the right patient? Well, you heard this model. Um, we know that concussion is not homogeneous. It presents very differently. So um, by show of hands, how many of you all in this group have had concussions? 
quite a few. So if you think about your own experience with concussions, can you see how perhaps some of you might have felt that it really created a mood issues, it created anxiety, it created feelings of being sad or depressed. For other people, it might have created dizziness, others, headaches, cognitive problems, very differently. And so the idea that we would implement one treatment for all of those problems is silly. Um, so figuring out what groups are most likely to benefit from intervention um, is key. And two of the groups that we found are the patients that are in the vestibular groups and in the ocular groups. And that is because of, this, of the research that we know with those symptoms early on. So if you have on-field dizziness, which is a vestibular symptom, we know that you are more than four times or more than six times more likely to be in that PCS group. So athletes who are dizzy, you know, those vestibular subtypes are absolutely ones we want to consider intervention for to try to influence that PCS. Um, we know from other studies, even um, with the presentation of those vestibular and oculomotor symptoms in office afterward, not just on field, but if they're persisting in office evaluation, also the, those are going to be the patients that are going to take longer to recover in these other studies. So we know that that um, we have great evidence that these are the folks that, that have problems and they're, they're lasting. So what are the problems that we're seeing? So in the vestibular world, um, vestibular dysfunction, and, and Mickey kind of alluded to some of these issues, manifest in different ways. One is positional vertigo or benign positional vertigo, which is an inner ear problem. It's one of those actual peripheral vestibular problems. Um, so um, if you think about the vestibular system, it's the motion detection system of the brain. So the inner ear is the sensor, just as in the visual system, the eyes are the sensor, the inner ear is the sensor. And athletes following a concussion can have mechanical disruption of the inner ear where small crystals, otoconia, so we all really do have rocks in our head, not just your mother telling you that. Um, but they can become dislodged and create some aberrant vertigo, which can be managed, but it has to be assessed. Um, VOR impairment, which is what um, Mickey showed you with, with the head movement. So the reason I can stand here and talk with you all and move my head and be dynamic is because my VOR is active. It's the fastest reflex in your body. <laughs> it works, nobody ever thinks about their VOR unless they're having problems, and then you become dizzy. So VOR impairment is very common. Visual motion sensitivity, so in busy environments, you have the inability to, to filter out visual information, and that becomes a, a strong sensory conflict and becomes a, a big issue. And balance impairment, which I think most people are somewhat familiar with, but and I, it's, it's worked into some of the SCAT and some of the on-field assessments, but balance impairment I put last because really it's, it's the easiest one to, to treat. So symptoms of vestibular, pro of vestibular dysfunction are going to be balance impairment when patients are in the dark or dizziness in general, um, trouble focusing um, when they move quickly, they feel like their vision is one step behind, busy environments. So, you know, if, if somebody with a vestibular problem after their concussion had tried to go to an event like this, they would immediately become symptomatic. This would be incredibly difficult, whereas a different type of concussion presentation may not have this type of um, problem at all. So now on the flip side, oculomotor dysfunction after concussion um, presents in very specific patterns also. So convergence disorders, and again, just to kind of um, explain, now these are not the only oculomotor things out there, but we certainly see that after concussion, there are these very specific patterns. The near vision system is very vulnerable in concussion. So convergence means the ability to see an object as single as you bring it in closer to you. So if you do this yourself and maybe look at your pencil or your thumb or some print and you bring it in towards you, you should see it as a single object without it turning double um, within five centimeters of your nose. So that's normal. After concussion, we see that becomes receded quite a bit. And some people, it's, it's arm's length or further. Now, often this is a, a decompensation 
of a previous problem, but it becomes a, a big issue. And if you can imagine then, a kid who's trying to, uh, to take notes at school or who, um, a, a worker who has multiple screens on their desk and trying to transfer back and forth, this will become a huge issue. Accommodative disorders go along with convergence disorders. They're about the ability to focus at that near range. So it's not about whether objects, objects become double, it's whether objects become blurry at close distances. And that can also be affected. Pursuits and saccades become affected quite a bit following concussion, as probably most of us are familiar with. And then one other thing that we see that is probably the underlying cause of some of this is that um, ocular misalignments are actually very common in the world. So um, most of us are not completely symmetrical in our bodies. So you might have one leg that's shorter than another. You know, there are asymmetries that exist. Well, there are asymmetries that exist in your visual um, system as well, where your eyes aren't necessarily always lined up together. Now, in people who um, are, are, have uh, extreme versions of this, they actually have a strabismus, where you'll see one eye is, is, um, is uh, wall-eyed or cross-eyed, and that's, that's more of an overt problem. But many of us have more subtle problems called phorias, where it's a misalignment that's relative to one another. And what happens is, because we have our visual system from birth, our eyes, our brain controls our eye movements such that that is compensated for automatically over the years. Well, after a concussion, that becomes decompensated, and you see then visual activities become very symptom-provoking. So all of these things become part of the assessment um, for the oculomotor system. But from a screening purpose standpoint, the way we figure out if these are kind of the presenting features is we use our symptom reports. Is there dizziness? Is there blurry vision? Is there double vision? We combine that with balance testing. We combine that with the VOMS, which is a, which is a really quick screening tool to look at these issues. And then when there are issues, then we kind of do a much more detailed evaluation. So this is, Mickey spoke about the, the VOMS, and this is kind of a quick pictorial of it. But what we know is that it, it kind of has benefit in that it will help you identify a concussion. Um, so it, it's very um, telling and, and um, more so, or it works with symptoms to help identify whether there's an injury. But it also helps to identify the subtype of injury that you're experiencing. <clears throat> All right, so what is the right type of therapy? Well, um, there is good evidence about vestibular and oculomotor therapies in management of these conditions, both in the non-concussed world and in the concussed world. These are examples of three studies from the vestibular side of things and two in the oculomotor side. Now, of course, we need more. Um, but we, there is literature that supports that, that when you implement these types of therapies and treatments for these problems in the right patient, you do affect change. So um, again, powerful information. So vestibular therapy after concussion, what does that mean? People always ask me, what, what do you do in therapy? So um, if people have that benign positional vertigo, the, um, the, the crystals in your ears get out of place, very simple maneuvers that vestibular therapists will do to fix it. And, um, you know, I've made a lot of friends for life. When you fix somebody's vertigo, it's, it's, a, it's a very um, uh, wonderful thing because um, it's one of those very few things that there is a quick fix for. Um, you treat the balance problems where you manipulate the, the surfaces and vision to make sure that, that their balance is recovered. But probably the biggest thing I work on are those problems with visual motion sensitivity and VOR problems, and that involves a lot of dynamic movement. So for example, um, Ray, if you want to play the top video, when people have problems with moving their head, these types of adaptation exercises are extremely important and extremely helpful. And again, very evidence-based as to beginning those types of simple exercises and then, of course, progressing them to different environments with different dynamics, different speeds, different targets are extremely helpful. Um, with visual motion sensitivity, you have to expose in a very systematic way patients to things that, that create some of the symptoms. So, if you play the, um, the bottom left one, right? 
So something as simple as having somebody follow a target, move it, is creating some of that visual motion stimulus. And depending on where I would do it, if I did it in a plain environment versus a busy environment, I create more or less of that stimulus. And I'm looking for a dose response. I'm looking for some symptom provocation that can be, um, that there's a learning effect from. And then if I have a patient who has gotten to a certain point, but they still have some high sensitivity and very visual, very busy visual environments, I might do, you want to play the bottom right one? So a disco so, ball, um, so, so we do have fun in vestibular therapy sometimes. Um, but the idea is that you have to somehow create exposure to some of the things that are provo provoking. The thing that you have to be cautious about is that often these patients are very headache prone, so you don't want to provoke migraines. You want to be um, very mindful of those things. You want to be cautious of their anxiety tendencies and things of that nature. So it really does need to be done by somebody that, that has <coughs> some skill and some, some experience in these areas, but, um, uh, but it can be done very well. With the vision therapy, there are a whole host of very, very low-tech types of activities that you do to treat those conditions that I spoke about, things ranging from um, dot cards and strings, uh, Brock strings, to very high-tech computerized um, uh, activities. So again, um, very evidence-based. There's, um, there's good, um, good literature to support using these things when these ocular motor problems exist. Of course, not for everybody. So last, what I'll do is, is speak a bit about exertion therapy. Um, and this is something that, um, and in this picture, uh, our colleague, Kara Troutman, is, is, our, um, is the person who's developed all of our exertion programs, and um, I'll share a little bit about our approach that she's developed. And you notice this is an athlete that she's working with that is still symptomatic, um, but she's created programs that will help to address their specific sensitivities. And um, so I'll, I'll just piggyback a little bit on, on the idea of rest, and I do consider it, it dogma. Um, and you know, though, that a lot of the consensus statements um, promote the idea of rest until returning to sport. Um, we even have it, so um, in Pennsylvania, and I don't know how many of you have been to the states, I think many of you have, um, we're Pennsylvania, so we're in the western half of Pennsylvania. New Jersey is our, the state directly to the east of us, so it's, but it's on the other side, so it's about a six hour drive. We see a ton of patients from New Jersey, um, and this is what is published in their on, online from their Brain Injury Alliance is that rest is the cornerstone of concussion management. While any individual is symptomatic, physical, cognitive, and social rest is recommended. So this is what is told to, you know, if, if a parent goes on this website and looks, they're told that their child should do nothing and rest. Um, and so hence, we see a lot of patients from New Jersey six months after their injury who are still resting. Um, and there's a whole lot of um, counterintuitive information out. Uh, there's a good bit of um, empirical information, but there's also intuition about rest. And we know that within in non-concussed athletes, we're withholding them from activity promotes depression and anxiety. And you already know that, that there's a big mood component to some people's concussions, so that should be um, a red flag. Um, we also know that migraine is also one of those big areas of potential inner, or potential problems after concussion. We know that if you don't exercise enough in migraines, your migraine problems are going to get worse. And uh, Anthony spoke about the, the Danny Thomas study that actually looks systematically at rest versus uh, kind of more of a rest for a couple of days and then resume normal activity as your symptoms allow, that that approach actually was superior. So fortunately, we have that. So. <clears throat> If you think about the breakdown of these potential profiles after concussion, and think about them independent of concussion, so think about if um, if you are um, if you know somebody that has a mood disorder, somebody that only has migraines, and you, if we search the literature, you look at recommended treatment for those individual problems, and most of them require or recommend some type of exercise. So vestibular problems, as Mickey spoke about, we always do exercise for. Um, 
for post-traumatic migraines, we're always recommending the right degree of cardiovascular exercise. For anxiety and mood issues, absolutely exercise is part of the, of the, of the program. So most of these conditions have exercise as a piece of it. So if these are the manifestations afterward, we really need to be thinking about this. So can we influence the development of PCS with doing exertion therapy in these symptomatic individuals? And there isn't a lot of research, but there is literature that has looked in specific groups at, at um, being able to exercise patients who are still symptomatic. And all three of these studies, one was done with children in Canada, the other two were done with adults um, in, out, out of Buffalo. All of them showed that there were positive gains made in different ways with these groups. So um, I, again, hopefully we're convincing you that, that perhaps we need to, to kind of have a little more modulated approach to, to rest. Um, but when you think about exertion, the type of exertion <coughs> is probably also pretty critical. So most exertion protocols are very um, static, um, looking at just cardiovascular influences. But if you again think about those problem profile patients, those patients with um, vestibular issues or visual issues, um, we think, um, and hopefully the, the literature will begin to support this, that you need to have much more dynamic um, activity and you need to challenge the system dynamically because those systems will only become engaged with those act types of activities. So these are examples of the things that Kara has in her program where um, of course, we do cardiovascular um, exertion, but there is always very specific movement-driven activities um, and dependent on the patient sensitivities. And then finally, what is the right time to, to intervene? And we certainly don't know the answer to this completely, but we know a little bit about what's been done in animal models and a less, less, but some in humans. So in animal models, what, we've, what has been found is that in the very, very early days following concussion, uncontrolled activity actually causes more um, cognitive deficits. That, that animal mo and animals, um, when they're, they're uh, allowed to be fully active too early, it's, it's a detriment um, to recovery. However, and in this study, the time frame was 14 to 20 days, which may or may not translate to humans, but there was a time frame in which actually the activity became um, that improved recovery. And I think that's what we're trying to get at in, in our management of, of humans with concussion. So again, the only study that I know of that really looked, and again, this was a retrospective study, so the design was poor, but, but it looked at uncontrolled activity um, in high school athletes following their concussion led to poorer outcomes. They, they took longer to recover, had a higher symptom profile. But on the flip side, in that same study, the athletes who, were, who, compl who rested completely also had poorer outcomes too. Um, so again, I think just to summarize, I, I, looking at how do, you, how do you have the most enhanced outcome probably has to do with looking at what is the right type of therapy and the right type, subtype, and right profile of patient and, and at the right time. So I don't know how you get at um, that the things on the right side of the screen without the things on the left side of the screen. I think that you have to have some way of breaking down patients into these profiles, um, whether they're exactly these profiles or something similar is probably for debate, but this is what we use. So, um, And then in summary, Again, hopefully you, we're going to con continue the dialogue about rest being treatment for concussion. Hopefully we've given you at least enough food for thought to consider that maybe that um, um, may actually prolong recovery if you implement rest for too long. Um, I think that what we have to do is look at, at research um, for specific types of treatment um, in the recovery to modify um, the, the, um, the emergence of PCS. Uh, I think that what we're seeing is that certain therapies, there's some beginning evidence and budding evidence. We have to study that further. And then, of course, the idea of, of looking at profiles and subtypes is, is critical in, in managing concussion. All right. Thank you.